Coming out of Brooklyn, New York, Tyrone Williams, along with Mr. Magic, was responsible for creating the biggest platform in hip-hop in the mid-80s called Mr. Magic Rap Attack on WBLS in New York City. That one hip-hop show was responsible for generating millions of listeners across the tri-state area and launching the careers of most legends and icons we revere today. Also known as Fly Ty, and was the founder and owner of Cold Chillin' Records, who launched the careers of Roxanne Shante, MC Shan, Biz Marquis, Big Daddy Kane, and Kooji Rap, to name a few. In this exclusive two and a half hour sit down, Fly Ty Williams will break down his career, his thoughts on music, and will definitely cause some controversy on his thoughts about Leo Cohen, Russell Simmons, and Andre Harrell. He has some incredible stories about the music industry that involve guns, drugs, and violence. Here's a snippet of what's to come. How did, how did you get started in the business? Well, I started in radio. Um, I produced the uh, first ever hip hop radio show called the Mr. Magic Rap Attack. Uh, Frankie Crocker actually put me and Mr. Magic together because uh, in those days, you couldn't be on the radio without an FCC license. And I was actually on the AMWLIB. I was doing, covering high school sports, plus the Knicks, and I was the on-the-street reporter. And, um, to, you could, if you didn't have an FCC license, like I said, you couldn't be on the air, but you could work under someone else's license. Right. And no one would let Magic work under their license. Because Why not? I, not because of Magic. They just hated rap. Right. That was the. That was and what the, year was this? This is 1981. 1981. Going to, at the end of 81, going into 82. And it's just that they just did not like rap. The engineers wouldn't. Any engineer could have done it, but they wouldn't do it because, like, you know, and I couldn't understand. Like, what you think? You're going to curse on there? He's not that. Now, I also knew Magic from junior high school. Um, he was called, we used to call him Speedy. He could play basketball. He was real, like, as a point guard. He was fast. Um, and so I knew him. And I watched him um, actually start building speakers when he was in high school. Uh, he built speakers for people like Maboya, Cool Her, Pete DJ Jones, Disco Twins, Dial Twins, Infinity Machine, Hollywood, everybody. You know, if your, your speakers weren't custom made by Magic, and by that time he was going by the name Lucky, then you didn't have good speakers. Anyway, Frankie Crocker comes to me and asks me to get with Magic. Both of y'all got a high school audience, I got a young audience, why don't y'all get together? So it was all right with me. I became the producer of the Mr. Magic Rap Attack. Now, if you came in on the, on the programming log, it said the Mr. Magic Rap Attack, but on the FCC log, it said the Tyrone Williams Show. And you would have to, like a taxi cab, you had to put your license in the slot. Right. Inside the studio. So the FCC people came, they would see your, your license in the slot. So, so how did you get a license? What made you get oh, a license? Okay. I, went, I graduated from Howard University in 78, 1978. Uh-huh. And I majored in business. And I got a job at City Corp, 111 Wall Street, which was big in my, in my family. First of all, I was the first person in my family to see a college. Right. Uh, so I graduated, you know, my, everybody was proud of me. And I got a, now, I got a job at City Corp, and at that time, City was like the elite of the recruiters. They would pay me $17.5. That was big. I was getting $350, $320, $25 a week. And you couldn't tell me nothing. Well, when I got to Citibank, I was a token. Because it was unusual for black people to be in that position. And I was a token, and and I was, I'm always an idea person, I'm always thinking. And my ideas couldn't be generated. I had to go through 100 people just to kind of get somebody to even listen to me. So I got tired of it and one day I'm reading the newspaper about an anchor woman named Sue Simmons. She was on NBC TV. And she was an anchor woman at Town 4. And her story was she dropped out of Julia Richmond High School, was making $120 a week somewhere, decided to go to an announcer training school. Went there, got an FCC license, went to Mississippi, then Atlanta, then DC, then New York. So I said, damn, she could do that, I could do that. I went to the same announcer training school, 
got my license, cause, and the reason I did it, like I said, I was getting bored at Citibank, and I couldn't have my ideas implemented, so I was out, and I didn't want to be a token. And I left, I got my first job, it was in Dover, Delaware. I was the first black morning man in the state of Delaware. Really? Yeah, first one. They used to call the station, get off our station, nigga. Stuff like that. They used to do all that. They ran me off the road, turned my car over, all that. And I never got scared. I got mad. Right. Because they was squares from Delaware. I couldn't I couldn't go back home saying they ran me home. I couldn't come back to Brooklyn saying Delaware ran me home. So I stuck it out. And before I knew it, but what I did, I never made it a race issue, no matter what. Right. I made it right and wrong. Before I knew it, they were loving me down there. And how long did that take for that, that I stayed there a year and a half, almost two years. Right. All right. And then I was at, I left and came back to New York, working at the Department of Street Lighting. Because I also had a, um, a degree in computer science, and I went to an IBM school to learn how to key punch and program computers. So I got a job for the city doing that. And my friend of mine, and Kassim, we call him Kassim, really. he's Dr. Ashborn now. He's uh, at Alabama State. Uh, he was going to Brooklyn Law School. And Jeff Barnes, who was a personality on WLIB, uh, was going to Brooklyn Law School. And Kassim got him to get me an interview. And I was like, this, if I get the interview, I'm getting the job. And I got the interview, same day, so when can you start? I started. And as I moved, so you was a personality first. I was a person. I was a, a, a sports. Well, I had a sports show with a guy named Pat Atwell, who was my boss. My media, he was a supervisor. Uh, Larry Hardesty, who's a manager at ESPN now, <clears throat> and Saeed Shabazz. Saeed Shabazz was the only black AP writer, Associated Press writer, back then right. in sports. And all the white, like Mike Lupica and Peter Vesey, they were jealous of him because he could get all the interviews. And they thought it was because he was black. He said, he taught me, he said, Ty, it's not because I'm black, it's because I understand when I'm not working. Meaning, I don't tell everything I see. Right. When I got the microphone, I'm working. But we just hanging out in the bar. And I see I can't talk about that because we just hanging. I can't do it. So anyway, with Magic, uh, we're killing the numbers. We're we getting 35 share. Now, that, now you with Magic on in Maryland? On BLS. Or, or BLS. now this is BLS you talk about. Right. So you come to BLS in 81? Right. Okay. Yeah. So now we're on BLS. Don't worry about yeah. it. Mosquitoes love me. <laughs> <laughs> right. They so, sure do, because there's about two of them right next to you. They to bite me. I'm telling you, they bite me all the time. I ain't worried about it. Don't worry too well. As long as they don't get you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, 81, me and Magic are together. Um, we. we we beat this kid, Marley Mall. All right. Where did y'all meet Marley at? Through Dr. Bob Lee. Doctor, we used to have these three vans called Juice Mobiles. Right. Magic was Sir Juice. Right. Frankie Crocker, who always was innovative, he made these three vans and called them the WBLS Juice Mobile. Right. It's the Magic's fans. And Bob Lee had one, Magic had one, me and Magic, and Walt Baby Love. And Bob Lee was from Queensbridge. And we had already met, it was really funny about we already met Marley's grandmother she was the uh, worked in the ticket booth at the Apollo mm. and Marley would never go to school and she said but he liked scratching these records and just so happened like maybe a week later we meet Marley with Bob Lee right a guy named Junebug was was probably Magic's DJ now we had a lot of DJs Grandmaster Flash was our DJ Star Child um, Hollywood, all of them had the DJ for Magic at one time or another. Right. And um, so Junebug was also a drug dealer. And he got killed. And um, so we just, Magic is just like, we need a DJ. And we just see Bob, and Bob said, what about Marley? Right. And Marley's 16 years old at the time. Um, I'm about 22, 23, something like that. We're in our early 20s. So we bring Marley up. And you could see when Marley comes in the studio, he was in awe of what he saw. The board was just something he had never seen before. Right. 48 tracks, he's got to play the commercials, all that. It's like, but well, he said the right thing. He said, because it's this, what they call potentiometers, but they're slides. Uh -huh. 
He said, where the two slides for the turntables? Marley was incredible. Let me tell you, because the turntables are not here in the radio station. One is over here, one is over here. Right. Marley used to do his thing on them. Marley went from asking, where's the two slides for the turntables, to being able to take the whole board apart and put it back together. Marley had our sound so different on the air that that was part of the allure to the audience. Right. Magic, um, Marley would pull the board up and he would pan the sound, have stuff coming out of different sounds on the left, different sounds on the right. He would pump up the bass, tweak the tweeters, and make our sound fuller. Right. And I was just, I was an engineer, not a board op, there's a difference. A board right. operator, somebody just pushed the button. Engineer in those times, you had to take transmitter readings, you had to adjust the transmitter, adjust the antenna, all of that. Uh -huh. So I would cheat. Because you your, your circumference, your, your, your listening area, wants to be a certain part, a certain part of the tri-state area right. in New York. And I would make our area go from Hartford to Philly. I would boost the antenna. <laughs> <laughs> so we was getting the heart of that. <laughs> right? Now, Frankie Crocker had his, was the only person who had an engineer besides right. Magic. All right? And Marley was his engineer, his DJ. Right. Him and they used to sit back to back. And Magic always said back to back, M squared, to right. back to back to, with N squared. They would literally sit in back to back. They took the back of the chair off. It was a sliding chair. Uh -huh. They would sit on there. And after a while, I had the key to Frankie Crocker's studio. Right. I just said, I want to sit in Frankie's chair. <laughs> I said, okay. Yeah. I'll open the door now. And Frankie's still like a cop. He got a round table and he puts buttons. They stuff like this. Uh huh. All right. And he had the Hall of Fame, the Wall of Fame, with all the greatest artists. That brand, came up. That came up. Right. So Magic is in Frankie's studio. Marley's on the other side of the glass. And I was, we have this, this, this silent communication. 